Thank you, John. So, good morning, everybody. How's everyone feeling? This is a Zoom. No, he's here. So, I'm Colin Hill. I'm the CEO this and co founder of ATIA. We are considered to be one of the first AI companies in biomedicine and healthcare. We, also uh, we were essentially doing AI before AI was cool, is how people like to introduce me. So really excited about the panel this morning because now we're going to talk about where AI starts to matter, matter the most in discovering and developing new drugs to cure disease and in really transforming healthcare. So just to frame the discussion on the discovery and development of new drugs, what are the problems that we have to solve? First off, we have to figure out what's the right drug target. Out of all of the gene products, and we have hundreds of thousands of them, what do we need to hit to stop Alzheimer's or colorectal cancer? Once we figure out what the right drug target is, we have to then make that drug. So what's the right drug against the right drug target? Then once we have the right drug, we have to figure out which patients will respond. So on the side of creating new medicines, these are the three problems that need to be solved. And just a, a quick FYI, it doesn't work out so well most of the time. More than 80% of all drugs that enter clinical trials fail. So how do we change this? How does AI start to really change this paradigm? Number one, we've been living through the exponential increase in human multiomic data. The human genome was sequenced in 2001 at a cost of $11 billion and took, uh, uh, took more than a decade. We can now get a genome in less than a day at a cost of less than $1,000. We, of course, have the exponential rise in compute power, and now we're at the stage where the supercomputing uh, uh, power can now reverse engineer systems at scale. And we have also the emergence of new kinds of AI that get all the way to mechanism and causality. So these three have converged to enable a wholly different way of approaching drug discovery and development. At our company, we use Gemini Digital Twins that we create from the data, from the compute power, and from causal AI to now start to reverse engineer the hidden 95% of circuitry of human disease, what really prevents us from making new drugs. We're going to hear from this panel on other ways of approaching this revolution from the discovery and development of new drugs and then the delivery of that care in the real world. So, Jeff, uh, I'm going to turn the floor over to you to introduce yourself and what you're doing at Flagship. Sure. <clears throat> so, uh, it's wonderful to be here. My name is Jeff. I'm a general partner of Flagship. I'm an inventor and entrepreneur. Um, 20 years ago, I was an undergraduate at MIT majoring in chemical engineering. And I fell in love with biology because of the, the kind of pictures that you're seeing here. Like what we call a protein in daily life is eggs, bacon, soy. When you zoom in inside of us or inside those, they are the most amazing machines, sensors, and smallest technologies that we have access to. And we don't understand how almost any of them work. So based on the idea that during my life we might understand that and we might be able to create new ones, um, I was sort of head over heels. Um, that has been really difficult to do, but for reasons that you'll hear on the panel today, artificial intelligence is giving us access to some of the rules that are present in DNA and the ways that those encode the functions of those devices that we call proteins. And uh, six years ago, I uh, 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 co-founded a company called Generate Biomedicines, where we started to imagine that you might be able to perform the most valuable thing in all of biotechnology today with generative AI, which is to predict what the structure of a protein would need to be to bind to a target at a very specific location. Often it's hard to be disciplined about one's choices of what to do. Um, this is easy. That's all of antibodies, all of peptides, and all, almost, almost all of protein therapeutics today. And today we go fishing for them in pretty laborious and inefficient ways. And um, in some ways that I'll describe, generative AI allows you to do uh, extraordinary things of ask questions like, what would the DNA sequence of an antibody be that would hit this target on a site that if you had access to a molecule for it, you might be able to cure a disease that today we have no medicines for. So I'm excited to talk about what the future may hold. Thanks, Fantastic. Colin. Ava. 
Yeah, so pleasure to be here. My name is Ava Amini. I'm a senior researcher at Microsoft Research within a group that we call the Biomedical Machine Learning Group. And really our vision there is to develop and pioneer new AI systems that can empower us to make new biological discoveries and also to get at this vision of actually optimizing biological design. And when we think about what we mean there, really the way we are thinking about it is sort of at all scales of biology, from the molecular level, like Jeff described, all the way up to the patient level. And we see this as an opportunity to now really integrate across those scales of resolution to now be able to deliver real solutions and insights for everything from biotechnology companies and industries all the way up to the clinical implementation. And sort of on background on myself, I came to MIT initially as an undergraduate and was enamored by this idea of seeing biology as the most exquisite computing system that exists. And I had this, fell in love with this idea of how can we bring the lens of computer science to better understand how biology computes, right? And so that has kind of propelled my thinking and, and the framework by which I approach research questions, which is always driven first by what does this mean for human health? How can this actually impact you know, human lives and improve patient lives? And even at a place like Microsoft where we're very much technology driven, this is the vision by which we're approaching this intersection of AI and biology in thinking about even when we come to define the new AI systems that we create, how can we guarantee that they actually deliver those insights that will make an impact in the real world? Fantastic. Zach. Uh, hi, it's great to be here. My name is uh, Zachary Ziegler. I'm the co-founder and CTO of Open Evidence. Um, I'm someone, my background, uh, I did my undergrad at Cornell and I started a PhD at Harvard. Um, but like many uh, other great folks, I dropped out of that because this is too important a moment to um, spend in academia. This is a moment to be building real things and building companies. So that's why I'm here today. Um, <clears throat> at Open Evidence, we're building the future of uh, medical information and um, biomedical information. And you know, we started uh, here talking about um, what are, uh, how, do we, how do we build new drugs? How do we um, put that into care? And one thing that is at the core of open evidence is that um, there's a huge amount of excitement around new drugs and new things, but at the same time, there's already an enormous amount that we already know about biomedical science. Uh, there's truly just a ridiculously huge haystack that is known, that we know is a species, and it's a, it's a haystack that is growing every single, um, growing every single day, and the rate at which that's growing is increasing. And so at Open Evidence, we're closing, we're closing the barrier between um, just this enormous amount of information and our ability to access that information and draw really valuable insights, both for um, pharma and drug discovery, as well as for physicians and, and healthcare as well. Awesome. Thank you. Tanish. Yeah, hi. Uh, my name is Tanish. Uh, I am currently a uh, research director at Stability AI and also uh, the, the CEO of this medical research organization called MedArc, which I founded. Uh, yeah, I've been you know, interested in the medical AI space for quite some time and especially applying uh, generative AI to medicine. In fact, uh, during my PhD, I was also working on applying image generation to uh, microscopy and pathology. Back then we were using uh, generative adversarial networks, which you know, now has, uh, m most people are using now diffusion models, but back then that was the state of the art. Um, so you, you know, this is something I've been quite interested in since about 2019 or so. Uh, and now more recently at, at uh, Stability AI and MedArc, I'm most interested in building foundation models for medicine. So that's the kind of research we've been doing. Uh, and mo more importantly, trying to uh, build these uh, models openly and collaboratively. So we've been collaborating with a bunch of academic institutions such as Stanford, Princeton, 
Columbia, and we've been working on uh, building these open foundation models. So we've built some models in the radiology space where we built uh, uh, image generation models for chest x-rays and a multimodal model for chest x-rays. We've also been working in neuroscience where we've been doing fMRI to image reconstruction where basically you take the brain activity and reconstruct what a person is seeing just from the brain activity. Uh, and we've also started to explore uh, medical language models now as well. So yeah, overall I think that uh, open foundation models is the future of medicine and healthcare and I'm really excited to be working in this space. Great. So one really deep question is, well, why now? Why is biomedicine at a tipping point in 2024 when it comes to AI? What has changed that has enabled this moment in what is the most important industry and application of technology? So Av, I want to start with you. Yeah, it's a really fascinating question. I think before we dive into why now, I want to kind of take a step back and say, in fact, We've been building up to this moment for quite some years. So even a, a tool like AlphaFold, right? AlphaFold you may have heard of, it's this AI model that allows us to predict the structure, the three-dimensional shape of a protein from basically a single letter code, a sequence of, of that protein. AlphaFold is based on many, many years of biochemical research that actually shows these principles of how we can use the relatedness of proteins to each other to now compare their similarity and make predictions about them. So we're kind of standing on the shoulders of giants when we think about the history of medical and biological research that has gotten us to this point. But really, I think the inflection point comes down to two reasons. One, because of the tremendous inflection we see in the technology, the AI models themselves, in their ability to reason over large amounts of, of data. And secondly, I think we're seeing this shift in biology that is taking us from what we think of a, as a reductionist point of view, of having a very specific question and a very specific hypothesis that we want to go test biologically in the lab, versus how can we take an unbiased point of view and look for patterns and reason about patterns in data without necessarily having a hypothesis to begin with. And I think ultimately it's probably going to be a combination of those two that get us the most insights, but the coupling of the powerful AI models and this greater ap appreciation in biology for that unbiased perspective has, in my opinion, brought us really to this, this point. Right. So really the marriage of hypothesis-free, data-driven approaches with more now expert-driven approaches is what you're, you're saying yeah. we're at a tipping point for, right? C completely agree with that. Um, in our case, after several years of being a platform company partnering with Pharma, we made a big change across the Rubicon to making drugs ourselves in the area of neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's and Huntington's and the rest. Let's also talk about the business models in this industry because while AI is really starting to infuse what's happening here, uh, there's also the question of how to ultimately uh, create value for stakeholders and ultimately deliver value for patients. So, so Jeff, since you're a, a VC, um, what would you say about the business models that are now being enabled by this transition where we have the data, we have the AI, and we have just new fundamental ways of doing things. Yeah, look, <clears throat> first of all, let me clarify, everything I do is based on technologies that I'm a co-inventor of, so I'm, I'm often not very good at kind of knowing what the external world is doing. I'm kind of like an ostrich with my head underground. Um, but let me bridge it to Ava's really nice answer in that the reason to believe there's any new business model would be based on the rules having changed. And the rules have really changed. Like the reason why not before, um, it's pretty simple. It, there's a deep irony for everyone who's been a life scientist that although our intelligence is biological, our intelligence sucks at understanding biology. So like we've only really had a glimpse, you know, sort of like, you know, our ancestors long ago seeing a few stars and, you know, not being able mm. to imagine the expanses of the universe, either in terms of how biology really works or the full remit of what could be biological technology. Um, and biology is this wonderful information technology. 
Like DNA is the blueprint of the living world around us. But while we've been seeing that code, we haven't been able to read and comprehend that code. Like there isn't a life scientist on the planet that can glance at a page full of DNA and describe to you quantitatively what that DNA produces and you know what its function is. So I think from a business model perspective, rather than imagine that AI might just kind of tweak biology a little bit, I think the better starting point is to imagine everything being flipped upside down. Like some of the dirty laundry of uh, drug discovery is that once you've entered the clinic with a therapeutic that you've spent hundreds of millions of dollars on and a decade plus, it still has a five to 10% chance of actually becoming mm -hmm. a medicine. So 90 to 95% of the time, we have failed to predict a molecule that could benefit patients without adding risk to their vulnerable condition. And if that becomes 50%, all of medicine changes. If that becomes 90%, all of medicine changes. And I think you're gonna hear variations on how the decision-making in medicine can be vastly improved with an overlay of machine intelligence. So um, I don't know what the business models of the future are gonna be, but I think the best starting point is a not function on the way that we do things right now. Fantastic. Tanish, what do you think is gonna have the greatest impact over the next five to 10 years in this space, whether it's what your company's working on or what you see more broadly? Yeah, I think, um I speak more from, uh, I guess, healthcare medicine background. I think um, the, uh, th there'll be a huge impact in the uh, with the development of multimodal foundation models that are able to process uh, you know, a, a wide diversity of clinical data and that will be uh, assistance to, uh, for, for doctors for making clinical decisions. And uh, I think, yeah, that's, th that's kind of where the, the biggest impact, in my opinion, kind of stands in terms of, um, uh, you know, changing patient lives. Um, of course, I think there's a lot of value in, in, in drug discovery as well, uh, but I, I guess I don't work too much in that space, but uh, I think, um, there, yeah, there's just a, a lot of value in, especially with, you know, the amount of data there is available of, uh, uh, you know, for, uh, you know, in health records, and kind of also uh, discovering, uh, you know, new new things from 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 these uh, health records as well. I think uh, the foundation models will also uh, uh, be very beneficial in in, in 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 kind of gleaning new insights from from these uh, health records that you know again with uh, you know you, you have this notion of of big data and, and, and learning from big data that you know uh, the the con uh, traditional approaches uh, struggle to um, to kind of work with these sorts of uh, uh, large data sets and I think these sorts of foundation models will help us to uh, find new insights that will uh, change patient lives and I think that's a, a very exciting area to be working in. Great. Now, same question to you, Zach. Yeah, well, <clears throat> you know, I, in, in thinking about uh, what all you guys have been saying, like, there, there's one thing that's really critical to me to, I think, all this discussion, which, which is what you asked before, which is what is, what is underlying, you know, why we're sitting here today, specifically? What, what's, what's changed? What's the flip that switched? And the, the way I understand the moment we're in is that um, we've learned something very specific. And that very specific thing is not that we've learned, um, you know, across the board how to what the right incantation is to say before we chain a generative AI model that makes Gen AI work. You know, what we've learned is that it's essentially the the exact alignment of three things that that makes Gen AI, Gen AI take a step function in terms of an improvement, and that's um, scale of model, scale of compute, and importantly, scale of data. And so, when I think what's important. Um, what's, what's, what's the world in five years going to look like? You know, wh what I see is that we've just taken this actually truly enormous step function forward in terms of our capabilities, and um, specifically our capabilities when these three stars align and we have these things. And I think um, that as a community, we haven't even begun to scrape 1% of what we can do with this new glorious world that we live in. And so I, you know, I think the, what we're gonna see in five years is that the companies that are successful are the companies that um, identify that, are laser focused on using this, these new capabilities to meet real actual needs. And um, you know, what that looks like is anyone's guess, um, 
but but that's where I see the future going. And um, you know, for for my fellow folks in this panel, I'm I'm intrigued as someone more fully in the language model space. Um, for folks, you know, like um, Jeff and Eva in a more kind of traditional biology space, how do you get those three things, especially and especially data? You know, great questions. <laughs> Should we pile in? Sure. Yeah. So Go ahead. Um, yeah. Ava mentioned some some of the ways in which a a couple rare factors align in historical data sets, which are high quantity, high quality data sets. Uh, we've used two of those in Generate, all DNA sequences that code for proteins. Um, the DNA sequencing community has been obsessing over the fidelity rate of seeing the code of life. The second is the three dimensional structure of proteins. So we started to imagine that you might be able to perform that most valuable thing in biotechnology of predicting what a protein would need to look like to bind to the outside of a protein. If you could learn the way that amino acids do like to interact with one, one another inside of proteins from all of the crystal structures that scientists over the past five decades have put on the cover of nature and the cover of science nearly, nearly every week. And um, that wasn't enough. So that allowed, allowed us to kind of crawl, uh, but we had to build a laboratory around mm. machine mm. intelligence so that millions of generated examples could be constructed, quantitatively tested, and every one of those successes and failures um, run back through the models so as to update their ability to be able to make this kind of prediction. And, and now we've been able to do some amazing things. So I'll, I'll give you one quick example, which is, Three years ago, um, we challenged the team to take the top $50 billion of antibody therapeutic sales and generate new antibodies that would hit the same target in the same epitope, in the same binding pose, with the same conformational structure at the interface, with comparable or better affinity, without going anywhere near the intellectual property of those parent molecules. Hmm. In three months, the team was able to do it for all of them. And by contrast, like you wouldn't be able to do that in a decade with a large pharmaceuticals traditional discovery approaches. So it's just like the very start of the rules yeah. changing when those stars align. But unfortunately, a lot of life science data is really messy, and so those stars don't align very often. So we're going to see a lot of labs built to facilitate this. So, so let's talk about that a little bit, when the stars don't align, because those yeah. of us who have been in biomedicine and healthcare for some time know that uh, it's always harder and more difficult to uh, make impact than we'd like. Um, what, what holds us back? What, uh, what will be, what, what are the critical factors for us to overcome for this revolution to really take hold and not be like uh, the world post the genomics revolution where it really took a long time yeah. to see any impact? Yeah, I, I really resonate and agree with a couple of points that Jeff raised in ter and, and what you just raised, Colin, in terms of what are those bottlenecks and what happens when the data is not that good, right? Because it is true that for many of these public data sets, some of them are high quality, but some of them, it is a pain, realistically, to pre-process and get that all in a format that's going to power these next generation AI models. And so I think one of the biggest needs is really that intimacy of knowledge on both the biological side and the computational side. To really realize success, we need to be asking the right questions biologically and clinically, and we need to reciprocate that with the ability to de deliver the technology to answer those questions. And so a concrete way of doing this at, at Microsoft Research is we have a very integrated partnership with the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard where we are specifically trying to realize this idea of closing the loop on that experimental computational cycle in the context of cancer specifically. So we have the ability to generate our own data that can train and improve the AI models that we develop and actually take the the generations or the predictions from those models and test them experimentally in the real world. And so I think that having that, you know, that close intimate partnership between both sides, whether in the individuals and the researchers that we train in the next generation or through working through collaborations collaboratively together, realizing these closed loop platforms will be really critical to uh, unlock those, those bottlenecks and release them. So yeah. scientific bottlenecks, and of course there's regulatory yeah. bottlenecks and eventually reimbursement bottlenecks. 
In our last minute here, I want each of you to just state a word or a phrase that's going to describe where we're going to be in five years. Starting with you, Tanish. Um, I guess the, the two words, I take two words, <laughs> which is open and multimodal. I think that uh, there, there's going to be a huge focus on, um, yeah, trying to uh, incorporate uh, different types of modalities of data from images, clinical notes, uh, you know, time series, all kinds of data. I think that would be very crucial. Okay. Fantastic. Zach? Uh, empowered. We're not talking about replacing biologists or replacing physicians. We're talking about empowering them. Eva? I would say imagination, right? The ability to dream and think about new hypotheses and actually test them with the aid of an empowering tool like AI. Fantastic. Jeff, the last word. Cures. We've been really timid to use the word cure in medicine for good reasons. It's been almost impossible. Um, I think we're going to be rightfully more and more courageous in aspiring to and achieving that goal. I, I love it. We got more ambitious as we went down the line. Let's, <laughs> let's end there. Thank our speakers. <laughs>